Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome the panel and all those who are listening in uh, to our panel at the Watson Institute of Brown University, um, dedicated to a new book, in, an important, in fact, pathbreaking uh, new book uh, by Umut Kurt. Um, the book is called The Armenians of Eintab. Uh, the Economics of Genocide in an Ottoman Province. Uh, and this is uh, the topic of our discussion today. We have a number of distinguished speakers. Uh, I will introduce them briefly, um, and then each of them will speak for about um, 12 minutes. Um, and then uh, we'll have a sufficient time also for discussion. Uh, the panel will uh, go on for an hour and a half, so in uh, Eastern Standard Time until uh, 1.30 p.m. Um, so I'll introduce the speakers uh, in the order uh, that they appear on the poster. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Michael Provence, uh, and uh, he is a professor at the Department of History, the University of California, San Diego. He earned his PhD uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, he has uh, lived and studied in uh, Syria, Lebanon, Germany, and France. And he is an author of a book published in 2017, uh, The Great Syrian Revolt, uh, and also has translated, um, which was uh, translated and widely reviewed in Arabic, uh, Turkish, uh, and American literature. Or, or publications. Um, our second speaker is uh, Christine uh, Filiu. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Um, uh, she is a professor at the Department of History at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she specializes in the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey and Greece. Uh, her first book, uh, the Ottomans in the Age of Revolution was published in uh, 2011. Uh, and her second book, Turkey, A Past Against History, uh, was published in uh, 2021 uh, and uh, focuses on the opposition dissent in Ottoman and Turkish politics. Um, our next speaker uh, is Alexander Korb. Uh, Alex is an associate professor in modern European history uh, at the University of uh, Leicester and was director of Holocaust and uh, genocide studies uh, between 2012 and 2018. He had numerous fellowships at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem um, and other places. Um, his research focuses on collaboration and uh, connections between Jews and other groups uh, during the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. And his current book project explores uh, the connections between Nazis and their collaborators. Uh, our last speaker uh, is my colleague at the history department of uh, Brown University, uh, Srimati Mitter. She's the Kutaiba al Ghanim, Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern History and International Public Affairs at Brown University. She also has an appointment at the Watson Institute. And she's completing her first book entitled A History of Money in Palestine from the 1900s to the Present, which examines uh, the economic and monetary dimensions of statelessness. And her broader academic interests include economic, social, and political history in the modern Middle East. Um, I will just say also a word about uh, our, uh, the author whose book we are actually going to uh, discuss today, uh, Umit uh, Kurt. He is currently at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. Uh, he was previously um, a visiting assistant professor at uh, California State University in Fresno. Um, his uh, PhD is from Clark University, um, in, and uh, his, uh, his current book, which we will be discussing, I, I do not need to introduce anymore. 
I would just uh, say one word. I'm also a professor of history at Brown University, and I'm mostly a modern European historian with a growing interest in uh, Israel-Palestine. And without further ado, we'll uh, begin with our first speaker. Uh, Michael, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, uh, Omer, and thank you, Omit, uh, for inviting me uh, to this, this, uh, this exciting discussion. Um, it's a, a real, it's a great pleasure, and I'm a, a huge fan of, uh, of, of this book, The Armenians of, of uh, Ein Tab, or Ein Tayyib, uh, as it's uh, pronounced in Vlad Sham, of which it is part, of course. So this is uh, Greater Syria. And, um, the book is wonderful, and to me, um, the, an exemplar of, uh, of, of Ottoman, post-Ottoman uh, social and urban history in a way that, that hasn't been done uh, anywhere uh, for any towns in the region. Um, uh, the town Ain Tayyab, uh, you know, um, uh, Omid's uh, hometown <laughs> is, uh, is very close to Aleppo. Uh, and resembles, and is, was part of the Aleppo province, uh, the Ottoman Aleppo province of Aleppo. Uh, so um, the border uh, between Syria and Turkey, uh, the Republic of Turkey, uh, separated this, this region in a way that I think um, with a kind of a brutality and, and, uh, and, and inhumane consequences, which, uh, which Umit uh, uh, defines and shows uh, really, really beautifully. The book is a is a moving and loving, uh, but very clear-eyed and critical uh, portrait of a prosperous Ottoman provincial town, um, and it does things that local histories of Ottoman provincial towns typically do not do, uh, which is to track the fortunes of the leading families uh, and where the money came from and where the property came from. Uh, over the, the the first half of the 20th century, so this is this is unique, and it's it's uh, of course the story is the story of the disestablishment, the destruction, the expulsion, uh, and seizure of assets of the the prosperous Armenian community uh, within uh, Ain Tayyib, um, and the shattered hopes of the constitutional revolution or restoration of 1908 uh, for Ottoman citizens, uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, everybody. Um, and so uh, uh, Umit does something unique in that he, because of, his because of his familiarity with the town, because of his access to archival material that other people have not been able to look at, he's able to, to find out uh, the property to discover through deeds, through uh, Armenian uh, archives, through Turkish archives, the the basis, the social basis of of the post uh, genocide uh, uh, social and economic construction of the town, he calls it um, the economy of plunder uh, of ruling party officials, connected people, and and what we would some what we might call conflict entrepreneurs of the period uh, of, of uh, the First World War and immediately after. Um, and the book describes in a way that I think has never been done before the, the legalism of seizure of assets, uh, uh, appropriation, and the use of abandoned property laws uh, in, in, uh, in Ein Tayyab. Um, and so, you know, I, the, I hope, and my questions, and I have questions, for Omid, uh, I want to wonder, I want to ask, you know, can, can this kind of social history be written for other uh, Ottoman towns? And I wonder um, if, if it can't even be a model for places perhaps in, in Central Europe. And, and I mean, this is a question for the panel really for, for Omar too. I, I had the, the strange and wonderful experience of making a, a dear friend uh, in 1988 uh, in, in what was then communist uh, uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. And about uh, three or four years ago, well, a little longer now, I had occasion to visit him again. And we visited him 
uh, in his uh, his his holiday house, which was in a an abandoned uh, German village in the in the the Czech uh, German borderlands. And he explained to me that his father had been given the house by the communist government in exchange for his good uh, scholarly service as an ethnomusicologist in the in the early 50s. But this house, unlike all the other houses in the abandoned village, had come with a resident. This house had come with a German. And the German was able to leave to stay in this abandoned village, this destroyed village, because he had shot off his fingers of his right hand, and so was not able to, he couldn't be conscripted into the, the German army. And so he had this proof of the fact that he hadn't taken part in the war or the genocide. And for this reason, he was allowed to stay in what had been his house and pay rent of one chicken a year to the new owners, my friend's father. So this is also the politics of dispossession and I wonder, you know, um, I mean, greater Syria, the region that we're interested here is full of places where the population has been expelled, uh, uh, have, where there are victims and refugees and perpetrators and profiteers, full. And to go back to Aleppo, we could say for certain that right now, there are grand houses in Aleppo occupied by Syrian army officers who have been given those homes from the government that has stolen them from the older inhabitants, some of whom were probably Armenians, who are now refugees in Turkey, irony of ironies. So all of this is to say, you know, um, can we take this and can we, and, and secondarily, of course, how unique is the, the story of, of Ayn Tayyib and how, how much can we, can we generalize it to the experience of the miserable experience of the 20th century and unfortunately the early 21st century uh, in, in this region, in the post-imperial region of Central Europe, the Habsburg lands, the Ottoman lands, and, uh, and, and so on. And of course, I mean, can we say, could someone write a history like this for, to take an example, I think kind of obvious example for Jerusalem, uh, where, where Umit is, is, is speaking to us. Um, and, you know, I think that, I hope that, that, it, that it's possible. And I think that, uh, that, that, uh, that this is something that we can hopefully look forward to and, and that Umit has provided a guide, a way to do this in a courageous and responsible and, and, uh, and, and clear-eyed, but also humane and loving way because it, it is his town and he loves it. And it comes out on every page. And this is a beautiful thing. Um, so, you know, can we have a discussion about in the, in the fully nuanced way about the, the long 19th century and its victims and its wars, its perpetrators, its refugees uh, without too much reference to national histories and the struggles of identity both in the past and 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 in, in the contemporary period, so this is this is um, this is what to me this is what Umit has has shown to be possible, and so I'm you know. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. And and of course, what you're talking about is not only history; it's also very present for millions of people who are still living uh, under these conditions or with these memories. Uh, thank you. Well, we'll continue now to Christine. Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and um, congratulations, Umit. This is, I agree, I couldn't agree more with everything Michael said. Um, this is, it's clear-eyed, wonderfully written and disturbing and chilling for the same reason, right? Um, it's unflinching. Um, and I read it, I read it as a fellow traveler in many senses, partly um, in that my grandparents bore witness to some of not Ein Tab itself, but related events uh, to the genocide as they were being deported as Greeks in 1915. Um, and as a fellow traveler, as I've been watching 
um, Watts, the workshop in Armenian and Turkish studies as I watched it unfold as a grad student and young scholar. Um, and I watched this whole um, mission or enterprise of Turks and Armenians and others coming together to try to, to try to really write a grounded, empirical, integrated history of the genocide. And um, as we all know, there are pioneers that came before Umit, but this really, I think, is an important turning point, this book. So of course, there's the Tanar Akjam, there's Ron Suni, who wrote the kind of synthetic work um, summing up uh, what had been achieved in scholarship up to the centennial in 2015. And um, there have been a couple other sort of partial local studies, but I do think this is a kind of a watershed book. Um, and it, in being a very a thorough, like we said, an empirical study of not just the, about the loss of life, but about property and about the kind of sinews of state and society that are involved, implicated in this process. Um, using Ottoman and Armenian sources, which I think is unusual. There's the kind of the Raymond Kevorkian, like the cataloging this kind of encyclopedic knowledge about what happened in each of these localities. Um, but the thing that I think is one of the things that I think is so um, important about this book is that it brings us from a discussion of numbers to names. Right? <laughs> you have this long appendix in the back of the specific Armenian names, the families, these were humans, right? It's a very humanizing approach to this, right? It's not, it is in one sense about money, you're talking about property and livelihoods and, and dispossession and confiscation, but these are humans that are being dispossessed. And I think that is one thing that just makes it both extremely eye-opening and also just emotionally difficult to read because we have to empathize with these people. It's not just nameless victims. And that is, it's something I think quite unique about this book. Um, I appreciated the, the economics of it and the political economy. Again, it's, it's, um, it's rare and it's difficult because it has been difficult to get at the sources until recently. So that is an accomplishment in and of itself to actually systematically trace the assets and the the laws promulgated to <laughs> confiscate those assets and the erasure of the process after the fact. Um, um, and um, the erase, and it, it's the book is poetic in its own way, and that the erasure is, you know, documented in the past, and then we see the results of it in the present. The erasure was so thorough that even Umit could live the first 21 years of his life in that town and not even be aware of the presence of that community, right? And that is also just very, it's chilling and it's moving at the same time. Um, um, the other thing that kept coming to mind and I, I over the, after reading Umit's book, I also read The 40 Days at Musadag over the summer and a bunch of testimonials um, of genocide survivors. And I have to say one thing that also really hit home is that we've come to talk about the genocide similarly to the Holocaust as if it was one event. <laughs> and it actually, it, it was really, especially in this book and in The 40 Days of Musadag, you understand that it was just, it was a countless series of acts and events and violations and erasures. And it was, it's a whole space. It's really a whole history unto itself. And as important as it is to have a word to describe this genocide, I also think there's a way in which it does us a disservice because we are able to use this shorthand and we off, it allows us to pass over the brutal details that, that Umit gives us in this book. And the details are extremely important to understanding what this was, what it meant, what it meant for the people who perpetrated it um, and the people who denied it after the fact. And it's just, it's, it's honestly, as a human, it's difficult to believe, <laughs> but it's, it happened. And so this book is extremely important as documentation of that. Um, and just this, in terms of Ottoman historiography, um, I found it to be a, a nuanced, very nuanced treatment of the state mechanisms that facilitated this, um, this process. 
um, that there, there's an understanding of the local actors in the government and the local elites, the bourgeoisie, and it's not just a black and white situation of an order being handed down and people are machines. There are these intricate relationships. And that is when I teach this period, that is one of the things I try to convey to students that the Ottoman Empire at this moment was a uh, very um, hybrid or very kind of um, <laughs> difficult to classify state formation in that it had these kind of uh, certain features of a modern state in terms of certain kinds of technologies or certain kinds of organization of law and administration. And yet it was really operating on the fly in a very pre-modern sense of informal um, power structures going on at the same time. And that's what makes it, it makes it very hard to kind of classify what's going on and, and for students these days to get their heads around it. But I think that you capture that nuance and that complexity really beautifully. Um, I don't actually have questions. I just, I would love to hear what other people have to say. I would echo though Michael's um, question about where we go now and whether you see this as a case study because I would see it definitely as a case study and a building block for people to do to work on other localities and to see what the patterns are. I also have been recently very fascinated with like the spatial turn and the visual turn in like digital humanities. And I think it would be amazing to try to visualize this data and this process that you're doing it. And I would imagine it would connect up if there were, if we did like a linked database, it would, these names would probably connect up with other localities as well. Um, and that would be an amazing kind of collaborative project that could happen. But for now, that question of the uniqueness or, or not of Eintab, I think would be fascinating to hear from you about. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Christine. Thanks so much. And uh, we move now to Alex. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Omar. Thank you for the invitation to that um, fascinating book presentation here. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm speaking to you from uh, Leicester in England from an empty classroom where I just finished my class and England is um, under snow. So that's a rare moment in time here. Um, yeah, um, my Honor is to comment on um, Umit's book from a Central Europeanist perspective. And um, I'm a scholar of the Holocaust here at the University of Leicester, um, namely of the Holocaust in Central and Eastern Europe. And I've been studying um, the um, Yugoslav case, Yugoslavia during the Second World War in order to find out how the Holocaust was intertwined uh, with the genocide of other uh, groups, namely of Roma and Serbs in occupied Yugoslavia during the Second World War. And um, of course, um, the book is a striking eye opener if you kind of start um, mentally comparing the case of Eintab and um, of all the locations that have been um, affected um, by genocide during the Second World War. Um, whether it's cities like Buhac or whether it's cities like Karlovac in Croatia, um, of course, the comparative questions just start popping up. So to ask, uh, to answer Michael's initial question, um, of course, this story could be told maybe in different forms and ways and with different sort of chapters and stories, but all, all um, over Eastern um, Europe. And of course, um, Umit uh, also admits that he benefits greatly from the historiography of the of the uh, Holocaust. So the scholars um, Umit is quoting in his intro are, of course, kind of the pioneers of um, scholarship of Aryanization, of uh, robbing the Jews by Martin Dean and um, other authors who, uh, also from, from Germany, like uh, Philipp Thea and Konstantin Goschler, who have um, really broken a pathway into conceptual questions. How um, do we um, study um, robbery and how does it link to, to genocide and when and how does robbery turn um, lethal? Nevertheless, it's of course an under-researched uh, under subject when we look at the Holocaust, um, when we look at the number of other cases, 
and I have kind of tried to look a little bit up the historiography of cases like Bosnia of the 1990s or the Rwandan case. And we still know so little about the ways how um, expropriation and spoliation have looked like um, and how um, redistribution and restitution after the fact, of course, um, have looked like how incomplete they were, what the patterns were, um, let alone comparative questions. So there is no scholarship that links Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and um, other cases where questions of the economic side of genocides are concerned. So this is um, an open new field and, and of course, um, uh, studies like, like the, um, like the ones on Aintapa are extremely important, but they also make us realize how huge the gaps are and how much work has to be done. Um, I, however, was uh, reminded of uh, similarities that kind of uh, open up the dialogue between the Armenian case and any other case of genocide that took place in Eastern Central Europe during the 20th century. And let me just very briefly um, um, address four phases of um, economic genocide in a chronological order um, and talk a little bit about the, the similarities. Um, and um, I think it's really important to um, maybe distinguish a little bit, and that's what, of course, um, Umid does in his book, um, between the different rationales and between the different levels of perpetratorhood. So when we talk about redistribution and expropriation of property, which is orchestrated from above, um, where the state is the main kind of looter, um, we are often talking about um, the state that targets um, Armenia, um, minorities, often wealthy and ur urban communities, whether it's Jews or Armenians or ethnic Germans in Eastern Europe, um, where they play a significant economic role in larger and mid-sized cities. And in that case, expropriation often comes before lethal violence. There is a state-run program that targets a minority, uh, minority economically, and um, the expropriation as such has a radical, radicalizing effect on the persecution, because what happens next is that the state then faces an um, impoverished um, minority without many means, with, without an economic significance, and the expropriation had that radicalizing effect in the sort of long run of the of of, of the genocide. Um, however, it was of course the state that that uh, targeted. The minority, not only for economic reasons, but the econo economy was the starting chapter of that, of that, um, um, well, um, onslaught on the minority. Of course, on a local level, and that's the second point here, um, the picture is completely different in places like in Yetvapne, um, where massacres break out, where neighbors often target um, their minority neighbors and the, the examples that come to mind are mainly from the Holocaust. Um, the motives might have been economic in the first place, but the expropriation often follows the, the lethal violence. It's following um, a massacre and the redistribution takes place after a massacre. And I think this is a very, very local um, phenomenon. And here often uh, bystanders or people who were not part of the uh, lethal violence get drawn into the redistribution process. That's a bit different with uh, the, the first example that I gave where there's often a pool of applicants and you know, it's often party confidants who benefit from um, expropriation. Um, here, of course, on a local level, it can just be a peasant who has to take then care of the cow of, of his former neighbor who had been murdered or who, who then uh, starts plowing the fields or, or continuing the work that his neighbor, um, neighbor had started. So a very different pattern when we look at the local scenario. However, what's most important, I think, if we look at um, European schemes of changing demographies, 
is that expropriation went hand in hand with a lot with grand demographic schemes, uh, population exchanges or population transfers that, um, well, might have started as ethnic cleansing programs. They became genocidal in some cases, in some, in some cases they did not. But here, um, resettlement went hand in hand with huge schemes to redistribute minorities, uh, lands and, and their mobile property, whether it's uh, population exchanges between Turkey and Greece or Turkey and Bulgaria, Romania and Bulgaria, Bulgaria and Greece. And here, of course, maybe a question for um, Umid would be whether whether um, officials in Aintab had um, earlier examples of population exchanges and, um, and um, large scale dispossession in mind, whether they have learned anything from their predecessors on that on that field. So in my country case study, Yugoslavia, of course, huge agencies are being formed to try to um, organize the dispossession on, a, on a, a professional level as grand as possible. And they also always have uh, um, plans in mind how to improve local agriculture, how to socially um, alter, even uplift a local society. Most of those plans, of course, plans, of course, fail um, mostly bloodily. Um, however, planning and practice are, are very much intertwined here. And what comes last and, and fourth is, of course, the aftermath of, of a genocide, um, the return of the survivors, questions of re, um, restitution on a, on a very local level. Often the survivors knock at the door of um, their previous house. That's what often explains new rounds of violence, what Jan Grabowski has described for Poland, sort of um, pre uh, preventive killings of returnees. Um, economically and not ideologically motivated. And I learned from him in his book um, that indeed 335,000 survivors of the Armenian genocide returned into Anatolia um, in 1918. And thanks to local studies such as this one, we know a little bit about it. But for Yugoslavia, we know nothing. We don't know how the state reacted to survivors returning and claiming back their society. And um, interestingly, in Yugoslavia, the, the, the state was a little bit, well, not indifferent, but didn't really find out how to deal with that. And in theory, being sympathetic with the survivors who were often uh, persecuted as communists. In practice, however, um, often the, the per perpetrators and the beneficiaries got away with, uh, with their theft. Um, so, this is um, really it. Um, maybe um, one question for, for um, Umit relating to that moment in 1918, whether there was actually sort of a window, of course, after the genocide, and it, it, it would be wrong to speak of healing or reconciliation, but, but was there um, a short window for undoing what has been done during the genocide and you call it a flawed um, restitution, of course. Um, but if there was an opportunity, when, when did that window close again? And why and how? So thanks for a great and stimulating uh, book, which my students started using already as I speak in this classroom. And thanks to you all. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for a very interesting sort of set of questions and observations. And we move now to Srimati. Srimati, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Umid, especially for writing this incredible book. Thank you, Omer, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It is really such an honor also just to see all of you on the screen because you're all people I've read and, and admired and hero worship. So. I feel um, utterly sort of a bit shell-shocked to be even in this Zoom room with uh, Christine and Michael, especially. So I'm going to start with actually where Umid's book starts with the Papyrus Cafe, because I think it was such a moving beginning. 
And it took me really, Michael has also already mentioned this, but it really took me back to the time that I've spent in Jaffa and Jerusalem in present day Israel, particularly in Jaffa, you have the same idea of these elegant old buildings, the beauty and the elegance of these buildings is key to the story. And they're devoid of the people who, who built them, who were responsible for this elegance. But their worth is, is very, very important because they're beautiful. And that is something that, um, you know, your opening actually mentioned is this beauty and, and this related to that, this willful ignorance and blindness about who it belongs to. And that I think it goes to the heart of what I think both Chris, all, all, of, all, all of you have said, which is the comparative aspect of this. That is, a, this is at once a very painful personal local story, but the comparisons to all these places that we study are so evident and certainly to me, the, you know, the, the, the clearest comparison is to the Israeli narrative, the urban architecture of Israel today. So that I think is, is where I wanted to start. But of course, as Michael has, has already said, this is very much a broader story of the Middle East in World War I. And here I just want to say how much I appreciate that the story of property confiscation is very much, you know, it has been studied in the World War I context, but mainly in the European context. This is the story of, you know, World War I leading up to World War II, which is the allied confiscations using enemy property laws of German and Austro-Hungarian property. And this is something that I've come across in my own research, that to the extent that property is part of World War I story, it is that story, European story. What is wonderful about this book is it, it brings the Ottoman Empire and particularly the Arab part of it, because it is, you know, it's really, it's right there on the border. And what I've, what I've found in my own research is that very similar things were happening in Palestine under the British at exactly the same moment, a little bit after. So in 1917, when the British take over Palestine during that stage in the war, they actually use enemy property legislations to confiscate Ottoman property in particularly Ottoman institutions. So the comparative aspects of this are not only just the broader ones that Alex has referred to, but also it's happening at the same time. This is part of what it means to be at war. And I think that that is what this book really makes clear. I think the difference is that here, the economic plunder and confiscation, and I'll talk a bit later about what words can be used. The difference here is, is the genocidal aspect which you don't have happening in the British occupation of Palestine at the same time. And um, I think that's what makes the story at once part of a comparative conversation, but also very different from that World War I conversation. And secondly, on the World War I story, in addition to the story of economic plunder and dispossession being very much so far Euro a Eurocentric story, the World War I story for the Middle East has very much been about state formation in the Middle East. This is the moment of mandates and then the Arab states. And what Umid's work really makes clear, particularly that last chapter, is that what are the foundations of these modern states? It's not just the political sort of mess of the chaos of the end of the Ottoman Empire, but the economic foundation, which states are strong? economically, in which states are weak and flounder, it goes back to the story of, of flounder. So one of the very clear things that you say, Umid, is that the, there is supposed to be a break, right, between the Ottoman past and the Republican, you know, creation of modern Turkey. And what you're saying is that actually it's the elites, the new elites who profited from all of this. There is no break that they became elites or they were already elites, but they became wealthier by profiting from this moment. And they're the ones who took on the reins of the new state of modern Turkey. So this supposed break between Republican and Ottoman is something that I think you're complicated. And again, I'm not at all a historian either of, you know, of Ottoman Turkey or of modern Turkey. But again, this brings me to, you know, to think about the Israeli case, that Israel emerges in 1948, it's a later story, but, you know, it emerges as a relatively wealthy, not very wealthy, but relatively wealthy story compared to Jordan, Iraq, Syria. 
And what are the foundations of that work? To a great extent, it's the plunder, the kinds of plunder that you describe in your work. So that is it for the comparative thing. I just turn my comments now to very quickly on two things that really, really struck me about your book. One is the lists and the second is the laws. We want to talk about the lists briefly because they're so harrowing. I think Christine used the word chilling, um, moving and, and chilling. And really, it's reading those lists that I had, and I have it now, I have goosebumps on my hands because the, the lists, they're so detailed and, and um, it's true what Christine said, that this is a story about people. I think we lost Rimati. She's frozen. Let's just wait one sec. Maybe she can unfreeze. I don't know if you can hear us, Rimati. That is the problem of doing things on Zoom. Um, well, I think we don't have a choice right now, but to um, maybe we'll get back to Srimati. Uh, I'm back. I don't know. Oh, you're, back. you're back. Okay. I don't know what happened. I got bumped out. <laughs> or maybe the Israelis are not appreciating. <laughs> Someone interfered. <laughs> maybe okay. I should have toned down my comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't know how much you heard, but I said I wanted to talk about the lists and the laws. I don't know if you heard that. On the lists, um, I just wanted to say I appreciate what Christine had said about this is really a story about the people, not of the things. But the things themselves are so incredibly moving. And I went through this Yakubian list, and there it's, it's literally, it's bedding. It's hand-embroidered silk clothes. It's books from the Catholic Church. It's bath basins, laundry boilers, seven rugs, you know, a child's pillow. And when you start putting those things together, you start imagining that child whose pillow it was. And, and that's where I think, you know, my goosebumps really, you know, out of control. So the lists are really, really important. Besides being incredibly moving, I think they help illustrate, you know, two parts of your argument. One is that this is a class story that the victims are actually really wealthy. These are social and economic elites. They have things like seven you know, rugs and you know, embroidered clothes. And it is clear that while the other ring of the Armenians has often, and I think correctly, been understood as a political story, right? And as a religious story, they're Christians, they're maybe not, you know, they're maybe not to be trusted. There's the Russian story, there's the whole Balkan story. But yeah, it's also, these are wealthy people. And we want their nice things. And I think the lists really help solidify that understudied aspect of the Armenian genocide, that we want their bath basins. Um, so that's one, I think, really important contribution of that very detailed, painstaking work that you do. And the other thing about the lists is that the perpetrator's list is the buyer's list, the, that in, in many cases you match them up. And that itself is. It's such an incredible work of, I think, detection that, okay, this is how I prove that whole larger argument about this is the foundation of the, the future state of Turkey is that the names match, not all of them, but the fact that you have perpetrators in one list and buyers in the other, and you have this Ahmed, whatever his name is, Aga, who gets those seven rugs. I think for me, this is the work of, 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 de of detection that is so, so, so important and original to this work. And on the perpetrators, I just wanted to say, I really loved the bit, probably because my own work is really interested in banks. I really loved, although loved is not the right word for any of this. It's it's like, if you hate it, but I was really taken by the story of the Ottoman bank guy. Who is this guy? This guy called Leon, uh, what's his name? Leon Rehan, who's clearly, this is not a Turkish person, who, as Umid shows in chapter four, he's actively encouraging the Armenians to put their valuables in the uh, uh, branch of the Ottoman of, uh, of the Ottoman Bank, basically saying that this is how you keep it safe. And my feeling, Umid, I don't know if this is wrong, but certainly in Palestine, in the Ottoman Bank, a lot of the management were Armenians. 
at least in the Palestinian branches. So I wonder if that was the case in the Aintab branch. Whatever it is, there's a story of trust here, that we trust this institution and the, whoever this manager is, whatever his nationality, he's encouraging Armenians to keep your stuff here, we'll keep it safe. And then the moment they're deported, he, found, he forms a company with other Muslim elites and he basically sells all their stuff. So this is a story that is so incredibly outrageous, but it's so vivid. And it also points to the fact that the perpetrators aren't just, you say they're the local elites and the neighbors and the Ottoman you know, central government, but here it's another perpetrator, which is a, Ottoman bank is a British, uh, well, not yet, it is British French at this point, institution. And the manager who is, who instead of being aghast at what is happening to his colleagues and his customers is actively involved in that. So that's all I'll say about the list. I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to say about, because, because I was cut off, I hope I can have one more minute. I wanted to talk about the laws uh, because I think that is a really other important um, aspect of this work. And there's you know, a lot that can be said about the legalization of the theft, which I think other people have alluded to. But I think I was really struck by a couple of things. One is the language of temporality in the laws. That this is a temporary thing. This concept of restitution that, that I think that's part of legitimizing this thing. That we're not just passing a law saying this is illegal, but we're just saying this is a you know, small thing. And when you come back, you know, and there's all this language about, oh, there's a fair value that will be exchanged. And I was really struck that it's not just the legitimation of the law that is happening here, but it's the legitimation of these norms of finance that you know there's all this language you use the equivalent value will be given to our means the idea that there will be a public auction right this is capitalism we have a free market we auction these things then we'll keep that money but in fact it's not a public auction at all everything's rigged and the prices are rigged so that so and so hussein Aga, whatever can buy the stuff and what is really interesting it's a minor detail but i think it proves the point which is that the first thing they do, even before they start confiscating Armenian property, is that they go around collecting all the debts and all the receivables that the Armenians own. So let's get rid of them. We'll take that property, but before they go, we'll collect anything that they owe. And it's sort of the greed and the smallness that's encapsulated in that, I think is, explains the larger story. And that this is not a fog of war story by any means. And Umit's work makes that absolutely clear. But really just that detail, that before you go, pay the two or whatever lira that you owe, otherwise, you know, we'll track you down. But you know, never mind about all your property that, you know, somehow later you'll be, you'll be given back. So I think it's really the lists and the laws that I wanted to highlight as, as I think very striking aspects of this work. I think I've put in some questions already in my comments. One question I did have was this kind of Ephraim Gymnasium because I was fascinated by the fact that you said there's this Armenian person who was acting as the interpreter to one of these commissions. And I was just sort of saying, okay, so this is how it worked. There, was, there were Armenians involved. So that was one question which you may or may not want to answer because it's a detail, but who is this person? And the second question was a larger question, which is what word do we use for these things? There have been many words that all of you have mentioned. Um, and of course, you know, you refer to this big book, robbing the Jews. So the word robbing is there, but you don't use that word. You use economic plunder, you use confiscation, you use spoilage. So I'm just wondering what word, is there a word that can be used when this is at once, as I've said, what's happening in World War I, the British are doing the same thing in Palestine, but it's not because it does, you know, here's the other part, which is the deportation, the people story, which is, which is what makes it unique. And um, I, suppose, I suppose I should really end there because I'm out of time, but thank you. Thank you very much, Srimati. Very uh, thought-provoking comments. Um, we are, we're gonna move now to Umit. I just wanna tell the, um, those listening that if they have questions, please uh, write them on the Q&A. And after uh, Umit's response, I will try to uh, read some of them out for the panel. So Umut, uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much for all these uh, remarkable and eye-opening comments. Uh, all of them is really 
broadening my horizon. And so nice and uh, honored to hear these significant point of views, constructive critiques from uh, prominent historians whose work have uh, greatly sway on my work actually. So it's really uh, such a great honor to be with you discussing my book and dissecting various aspects of it which actually you have done it pretty well, better than I did in the book. So I truly appreciate it. Um, so I, I, uh, I, was, I was being warned by Professor Barto for not speaking longer than 12 minutes. So I will do keep it as short as possible and try to answer uh, all your uh, questions and comments. Um, so beforehand, I would like to touch upon a few conceptual uh, remarks before zooming in on Ainzab uh, actually. So, uh, you know, there is this primordialist atmosphere that has been out there while talking about violence. So I believe writing about violence with an awareness of its embeddedness uh, in a specific historical time and place purges it of the primitive aura, let's say, that has surrounded it, an aura that, uh, that has long tarnished our understanding of the Ottoman Empire and the Middle East, let's say. So for instance, there is this literature, uh, rich literature on the urban notables in Ottoman and Arab cities from the 18th to middle of the 20th century has provided a comprehensive, a fascinating view of the political organization of urban society from local, imperial and national perspectives, but has offered only let's occasional glimpses of the violent social worlds of local leaders, entrepreneurs of violence, let's say, and their followers for sure. So which we, so we, dub, we hail them as perpetrators, let's say, so we call them. So my work in that sense tries to fill uh, that kind of gap. So I would like to start with uh, Professor Provence's uh, question about, uh, can this kind of social history be written for other towns? So here actually uh, the, 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 the main argument of, of, of my work and this book is that locality matters. Locality does really matter in order to fathom and also explain uh, different aspects of the destruction of Armenians, whether you term it genocide, it's, 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 it's a, another discussion of topic, it is genocide, but it's we, what we are talking about, a, a political violence and mass violence incident in the, in, in the Ottoman Empire and in the Middle East. So uh, I think uh, the same kind of work can be done for other provinces too. So uh, this kind of work enables us to understand social dynamics of violence. So as Professor Bartov has beautifully also done in the case of Buchac. So these social dynamics also uh, tell us why genocide or that kind of exterminatory violence occur in the case of Aintab, let's say, or in the case of Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, Western Armenia, why it did not occur in other places, let's say before 1915, why it, it happened in 1915. So that also, uh, that also makes me revisit this, this notion of restraint of violence in order to understand why genocide happened in Aintab, I, want, I would like to understand now what were the cases for restraint of violence to understand the whole larger picture. So uh, we need more regional works, more regional studies in the case of Armenian genocide. So we lay way behind, uh, you know, uh, Holocaust, uh, Rwanda genocide and Kremlin Roy genocide and other genocidal violence in Yugoslavia and in, in, in different parts of the world. So, uh, what makes Aintab distinguishing is that economic motivations were so concrete, especially from the perspective of local elites, provincial notables, ions in, in, in Ottoman, uh, in, in Turkish, and also, as well as other active uh, partic particip uh, perpetrators of this violence. So onlookers, bystanders, and also active perpetrators ordinary Muslim civilians, Arabs, Kurds, Circassians, very small number of Circassians and the other Balkan refugees from Crete and also Balkans, they were also relocated and resettled in Aintab too. So uh, this kind of work uh, provides us certain kinds of insights uh, to, 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 uh, to, to show that then genocide or that kind of 
mass violence is a social process. It is a, is a process, but it has a number of social dynamics among the neighbors, between, uh, et between et the diverge ethno-religious societies and so on and so forth. So, uh, and also another distinguishing aspect of Aintab is that local participation and was so fervent, uh, so concrete, so, so, so palpable in the case of genocide. And it goes, it goes, uh, it goes that far, it, 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 go, it, it goes even further that local elites in Aintab convince central authorities, the Ottoman ruling government, Committee of Union and Progress, to, 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 to make deportation this decision taken for Aintab. So center or the local authorities were more willing, more enthusiastic and were more zealous than the central authorities who were the main orchestrator of the destruction of Armenians, especially in Eastern provinces. But in the case of Cilicia, first and foremost in Aintab, these kind of uh, active, uh, active and fervent participation of provincial notables were uh, much more uh, vocal uh, and outrageous in the case of Aintab, I would say. And also, from the perpetrator's perspective, this work uh, provides us to a certain extent to, un to, to, to show that actually ethnic hatred or ethnic differences do not play that pivotal, pivotal role, also ethnic nationalism, I'm including that aspect as well, in the destruction of Armenians. So these kind of differences, these kind of ethnic hatred were, uh, were of course they were, they were dynamics, but they were not the, 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 the main or major dynamics which led to violence. Because it's really, uh, it, it, it depends on the episode. It varies from episode to episode, moment to moment. And certain perpetrators act like a perpetrator at some point. And in other episode, they act like rescuers. So the, the law fault lines were really fickle and hazy and murky in the case of Ayn Tapto. Of course, you know, these kind of arguments are, sound quite familiar for a Holocaust historian, but in our field, these kind of findings are quite new. So I really uh, want uh, my colleagues to get used to hearing those kind of, you know, argumentation as well. Um, so in order to substantiate these economic motivations, our main problem is lack of, I mean, not lack of sources, sources are out there, especially so. Uh, in this book, I came up with a report of an abundant liquidation commission. So it's the first of its kind. I just incidentally, you know, uh, just found this, uh, this, 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 this report, uh, uh, some Sarkis Yakupian's, you know, uh, descendants living in Los Angeles. They just invited me for dinner. And then all of a sudden, the one, uh, I mean, one of, uh, this, this sweet lady, you know, brought a box of documents and just pour in front of me. And all of a sudden, this report cast an eye, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then I realized all of a sudden, oh my God, it was an auction result of the properties, especially mobile properties, which belong to Sarkis Yakupia, her great grandfather. So abandoned property commission, commissions, which were transformed into abandoned liquidation, abandoned property liquidation commissions, Tasfiye Commissionları, they were founded in 34, 35 provinces of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire in Asia Minor. Aintab was one of them, Aleppo was one of them too. So their records were preserved and kept and those records are available in the archives but inaccessible to re for researchers. So we cannot reach out these sources, these records. And I spent almost one and a half year in the Prime Minister of Ottoman Archives in Istanbul for six to seven months each and every day. I requested these files. I asked about their presence and so forth. The, the archivist, very nice, very polite guy. He told me, you know, we have, we have them, but we have not classified them yet. So which indicates, so these, these, these records do exist. Uh, so in order to uh, make Aintab not unique, let's say, you know, so we need these sources available because the same commissions were founded in, in the province of Kayseri, in province of Izmit, in province of Bursa, and, and, and Harput, uh, Mamerutulaziz, I mean, so all these places. 
therefore, this, this liquidation report also indicates political and economic interests of these elites converged in all these you know, social, social political explosion, which found channel through, uh, through, uh, through violence. Um, and what else? So uh, res to respond to Alex, uh, actually, uh, when you look at the, 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 uh, the Russian, Russian case, the Soviet Russia during the World War I, the liquidation laws and regulation the Russian empire promulgated were exactly almost the same with the ones of the Ottoman Empire. So there is this parallel and a number of patterns in terms of confiscating and liquidating enemy alien citizens of the Tsarist Russia, Germans, Poles, Jews, Tatars, and so on and so forth. So exactly the same kind of process was taking place in Tsarist Russia just a couple of months before the Ottoman, the Union and Progress Party initiated uh, uh, the process. The temporary deportation law even was like a carbon copy of uh, the, the, the deportation law promulgated by Tsarist Russia. So Eric Lors, this important book, Nationalizing the Empire is, is an example, exemplary work for indicating that aspect too. And also uh, window of recon, uh, reconciliation or restitution process, Restitution process was initiated. Immediately after matter of the war, Ottoman Empire was defeated. Uh, Mondoro's uh, armistice was signed. And then in, in, in uh, late 1918 and early 1919, Armenians who managed to survive began to return to their homelands. And of course, their homelands were mostly occupied or sold out in the auctions and so forth. And, and most of them were occupied by the refugees uh, flow, uh, uh, coming from the Caucasian and the Balkan regions immediately after the matter of 1912 and 1913. So these created a huge and, tumult and tumultuous atmosphere and climate in, in, in so many provinces. Eintop was one of them. But, but restitution was really started and a number of Armenians who managed to survive or their descendants, they start to take, it, they take the, their properties back. But this process was halted uh, when the Kemalist liberation movement in Ankara started in, in, in late 1919, became the upper hand. And when, uh, when after Matt of, I mean, after Matt of the, the, the victory of the Kemalist uh, government in Ankara vis-a-vis -vis against the Greek, for Greek occupied forces. And then as of 1922, in, uh, uh, Grand National Assembly in Ankara, these restitution laws were rescinded. And in, 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 and, in, uh, and uh, when the Lausanne was approaching in Turkey, in Lausanne promised to give all these properties back to their real owners. But in domestic affairs, they were revising the laws and regulations. And these laws and regulations were exactly the CUP liquidation laws. So they were revising these laws in order to obstruct Armenians from claiming their properties back. And so this window of, of reconciliation, restitution actually came to, came to a halt after 19, 19, 1922, let's say. Um, as a response to uh, Sirimati, as for, uh, I mean, in this work, actually, of course, I explained the, uh, how the destruction process was carried out, all the you know, performative aspect of violence, physical violence and so, so forth. But in this work, I particularly focus on these legal papers. They are cold language, positivistic language, in order to show that we can uh, explain this total annihilation by focusing on these legal papers. So, I mean, that's why I also uh, invite scholars and my colleagues to revisit the notion of genocide, to think about it, you know, not from the physical vi violence as, uh, point of view, but also this 
uh, how one society, one group of people, one group of nation or race, how these groups could be turned into a civilian debt through these so-called legal rules and regulations and how all these plunder, liquidation, appropriations were carried out in concocted ways under the veneer of legality. So CUP leaders, the Ottoman ruling elite, these, 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 these people, they were obsessed with this legal, legal, legalism because they were not, uh, they, they did not want this, that this robbery became obvious. This robbery, you know, consp to, uh, tr transpired. So in order to conceal the state robbery, they also let, actually, they did, they did not want plunder in so many places. They also regulated laws and regulations and some, some sanction uh, uh, also the, the, in order to deter people uh, from uh, you know, plundering these properties because the state always wanted to keep the lion's share in their pocket. But CUP needed social support, recruitment. So they used plunder and they condoned so many plunder incidents in so many provinces, including Aintab, in return for social consent and support in destructing army or, or orchestrating Armenian genocide in, in the provinces. So, so the legal aspect is legalism uh, was, was essential for them to conceal their, you know, uh, stealing basically. So I think I must stop here so I can continue, but uh, we maybe get some more questions. Thank you so much for all these wonderful comments, eye-opening comments, and, and uh, it, it gives me a lot of meat for further work, actually, uh, as well. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very much, Amit. Um, so uh, I, there, there are uh, a number of questions. I just want to take uh, the privilege of moderating this uh, event uh, and just touch on a couple of issues that were raised. Maybe we can also talk a little bit about that within the panel itself. I mean, I think one thing that was referred to by, by I think most of the, the commentators is that this sort of combines, your, your book combines a, a, a local history mm -hmm. with a personal history, with a history that has to do with property. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting combination. Um, to me, this, 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 of course, raised a whole lot of issues, as you know, because my own experience was coming to a place that was erased. And in that sense, what your book talks about is, is history. It talks about memory, but not only memory of what is remembered, but also of erasure, and then of the politics of it all. Uh, what is remembered and what is erased, of course, has to do with memory. And um, my own personal experience was of coming to a place that I knew had been one thing, but there was no memory of it there. That memory had been erased, even though some of the material uh, remnants were still there. Um, and I wondered how people live in a place where they know or they should know that some of these material remains had belonged to someone else, or they may even be living in them. And it was only as a result of that that I began thinking of where I myself had grown up and that I too had grown up living with the remnants of what had been there before. So one of them was in Eastern Europe and one of them was in Israel and I'd grown up surrounded by remains of our villages right where I was living. And that sort of connection between looking at the local and the personal is I think what is what, what brings us much closer to the idea of genocide that in some ways is so inhuman and is so distancing that all we can say is we can't understand it. It's impossible to understand. In fact, it's completely possible to understand on that um, um, personal level. So this was one thing that I thought um, I really wanted to bring out. The second is this issue of, of property because you learn both that genocide on the local level is also always about property. Now it's both personal and about property, but property plays a very important role. And there I just wanted to uh, sort of respond to what Alex was saying. I think at least on the local level where I saw it, it was both, that is the population wants the property 
But the state, like in the case of Buchaj, also comes and packs it up nicely or has pe other people pack it up for it and then sends it to the homeland for use uh, by the state. And the population gets the lesser type of property and the property that cannot be moved. Uh, and the last thing that occurred to me because of your last, it's, it's not the last chapter, but the chapter that you were referring to now, and I actually raised that with my class too, I'm, I'm teaching a class on genocide, is that ironically what happens is that at the end of the war, the area of your town is occupied by the British. And it is under the British occupation that the return of the surviving Armenians is possible and it begins, it facilitates the beginning of restitution, which of course is then, as you just said, is ended with the Kamalist victory. And so here you have a moment where occupation or intervention can actually make a difference. It makes a difference in the sense that those who occupy have a different interest and they actually allow the return, although temporarily, of the survivors of genocide and robbery. So that's just a few sort of random thoughts that I had on this. And I'm going now to, uh, I don't know if you can see the questions, but I'm going to uh, just uh, raise a number of them and maybe you can respond, but also other panelists because some of these questions are um, addressed to other panelists in the time that we have remaining. The first question is from Lisa uh, Basumian. And she thanks you for writing the book. Uh, she, she, of course, uh, it, it means a great deal to her family. She says, we have so little information on what happened to my grandparents before they fled Eintab. I found their home on map two and just seeing the outline of that building brought the reality of their ordeal to light. My cousins and I have always wanted to know how it is that my family managed to stay there until 1922-3. So that's a very specific question. Can you respond in any way to that? Sure, sure. Um, by the way, uh, uh, Sirimati was also referring to the, the list of properties. Sirimati, list was longer than the one in the book, uh, but because of, you know, uh, pay pagination problem, and uh, we just only uh, determined, identified, the intensely populated area of Aintap Armenians, in our main quarter of the city. And, and we, we managed to put over 50 kind of locations, which, which I pinpoint the trajectory and history of the properties. But my list was almost, uh, my list consisted, consisted of 464 locations I pinpointed in the city. Uh, so, how, uh, so Lisa Barsumian, I, I, pers I personally know her too. So uh, Barsumian family, by the way, it's, it was one of the leading and, and prominent and wealthy families in the city, quite philanthropist and, and uh, intellectual and supporting education. And they contributed the foundation of uh, a, a number of Armenian uh, schools in the city. And Barsumian family also established a school on their name, Barsumian school we, we had. And, so the departure of Aintap Armenians from the city as a total departure, let's say, it did not happen all at once. It was a process. So the, the, it, was, it depended, uh, depended on the, the, the course of war between the Kemalist forces uh, and also the uh, local national forces in the city supporting uh, alongside uh, and sided with Kemalist, Kemalist forces and also French troops because after British occupation, uh, French troops uh, came to town in October 1919. And also there was a Legion d'Orient within the French troops. So, and this Legion d'Orient was considered Armenian soldiers. It, it, it evoked and, and, and led to uh, uh, and, and garnered uh, so many provocations uh, for, at, in, in the Muslim side. Actually, it was uh, the main uh, motivation for also Muslims to support Kemalist forces logistically and financially, the way in which they were reluctant in the beginning. Uh, so when the war was ongoing between these French troops and the Kemalist forces, some Armenians, of course, they were scared, they were worried about, it, and they were scared of the fact that the same kind of destruction would happen again. So 
they did not want to stay in the city, although they were also supporting French forces and they, cre they, they uh, created their own self-defense mechanisms as well in the city, they bravely fought. But when they realized, you know, that things were getting worse and they, would, uh, they, they were worried about the fact that the same kind of, you know, uh, consequence would happen to them. So they decided to leave the city as of 1921. So the last Armenians who were forced to leave the city in late 1923. So there were still almost 37, 36 Armenian families in the town uh, up until 1923. And according to first official population census of Turkish Republic, which was carried out in 1927, there were still over 20 Armenians living in the city. So it, it could it could it could happen. So it could be possible. Thank you, thank you. So now now we have a question. I'm I'm going to um, raise these two questions together, and then you and also the other panelists can respond. The the first question by Theodor Bogosian is: Has this splendid work made you persona non grata anywhere? <laughs> That's uh, an interesting question for an historian. And the second question by uh, Fethi Kelesh uh, is, uh, thanks for this intriguing panel. Uh, panel, I was wondering if the author and or panelists would offer their take on the constitutive, potentially at least role, not of remembering, but instead of forgetting in the eventual formation of an era, an aura of reconciliation. And I like this question very much because that's mm -hmm. something that I was also alluding to. So um, maybe um, if you don't mind, let's start with the rest of the panel and then we'll get back to you, Emmett. Sure. Uh, so anyone who wants to respond to that. Um, so I can say maybe a word um, on Fiti's question before handing back to the others. Um, so in my view, of course, um, remembering, uh, re uh, redistributing or um, restituting and reconciliating goes hand in hand and there is not the one without the uh, other, even though if you look back in history, sometimes restitution um, actually gum, uh, goes hand in hand with attempts to forget. So the German money, um, hush money basically paid to Israel in the 1950s um, was of course not an attempt to remember, it was an, an attempt to put an uh, end to the, to the past. So um, of, of course, I think um, restitution is the weakest element of, of the three here. However, we can learn a great deal from the patchy and incomplete attempts to restitute um, Holocaust victims, but we need to uh, learn and there can't be um, reconciliation without um, attempts to, to make good for what has been um, stolen. So my hope is that uh, lessons will be learned um, of course, in most cases, it's too late. We can't uh, restitute people who have passed away many, many years ago. And here, of course, the, um, the uh, debate of colonialism kicks in and colonial um, restitution, which by now focuses very much on museums. Um, but actually, last year, the German uh, government um, started considering uh, to to pay um, the well uh, the society of survivors and and their um, well no the the surviving societies of of, of Herero in, in in Namibia of course and we have to consider that these um, societies who have been victimized by genocide are still hugely disadvantaged they would wouldn't be as poor as they are today if it wasn't for um, for the genocide. So the Germans were very reluctant to call it um, an apology. And so reconciliation isn't there quite yet. And they are very re uh, reluctant to call it the restitution, but they arrived at the conclusion that, that money must be transferred. It's not ideal, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Um, I can I can also answer that uh, very similar. I agree with very much what Alex has said, but I would also say in the Armenian case and in the Palestinian case, which is the one I work on, these are stories that have 
officially not even recognized, been recognized, right? We still can't even talk about the Armenian genocide in, in Turkey. You know, this is related to the other one. I'm actually curious, Umid, can you even go back to Turkey or what kind of um, official welcome <laughs> do you receive? I was joking about me being cut off by the Israelis, but if these things exist, but those of us who are, we're not talking about something that happened in the past, uh, the, the victims are alive, the victims' families are alive, and they have not received any recognition. Um, and the people who are doing this kind of work are truly oppressed and in danger of their lives. So I don't think there can be any conversation about reconciliation until we're even able to talk about, um, about what happened. And this question about forgetting, um, who is going to forget? Who decides that? The victim will never forget, no matter if millions and billions of dollars are eventually paid. Um, so this question itself, to me, it doesn't acknowledge the power imbalances between the victim. And the, I don't understand what kind of reconciliation you would have when an Armenian can't even go back to Turkey and claim his or her property and has to rely on this kind of works. Exactly the same thing. Palestinians can't even enter. Um, you know, they can't even go to their uh, own country. So I'm not sure what that word means. I think in the colonial context, perhaps that can be a very interesting and fruitful conversation, but we're not in a post-colonial context in either of these two places. We're living in it. It is, it is an ongoing tragedy that people in Palestine, Armenians of Turkey, the ex-Armenians of Turkey live through every day. So I feel quite strongly that this question of forgiveness, forgetting, reconciliation, firstly, it has to come from those people, not from anybody else. And secondly, not yet. I think I have something to say. I'm not entirely sure what this person means about forgetting. <laughs> and I'm wondering if they mean as we bring to the surface these erased people, events, properties, if we are then also suppressing other things. And I'm wondering if that might be where the post-colonial comes in, in the sense that, and this is not to explain away or apologize for the genocide, but the impetus for the genocide sprang, sprang from, and the denial for the of the genocide still springs from a deeply held belief among many Turks of their victimization at the hands of colonial powers and the international power system at the time Christine, and since. Sorry, Christine, can, can you turn on your camera or because you're video? I can. Oh, thank you. Yes, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's what the person's referring to, but I do think that that is an important piece of the story that in this case, <laughs> these events were all bound up. And that, I mean, that is, I believe what prompted <laughs> Ottomans and Turks to, to do these things was their belief of their victimization in that larger arena. And it is worth discussing. It's worth trying to integrate that part of the story instead of, um, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not someone who's into like a hierarchy of victimization, but there are multiple dynamics that were going on at the time. And I know Umitz is well aware of that. And so I just wonder if that's what that person's talking about, that there is another kind of forgetting that happens as we try to systematically um, kind of bring to the surface, exercise, document um, these forgotten events. So that's how I might start to answer that. Yeah, you know, I would I would also say that um, I don't know exactly what the what the question meant, but my understanding <laughs> of reconciliation is that uh, in order to have reconciliation, you need two elements, and neither of them works on their own. One is to acknowledge, that is to remember, but to remember also officially. So if you want reconciliation in terms of restitution, you first of all have to admit officially that something happened and what that something was and to right. uh, assume responsibility for it. The second is mm -hmm. material. Uh, and as Alex was saying, the German government was willing to give some material compensation for the Herrera from 1904, but didn't really want to say sorry. So it didn't want to take the moral responsibility. Uh, but it is the two components that need to, so it's not about forgetting, it's about remembering, but also remembering officially, not only personally. Um, the, the reality of genocide, of course, is that it is always about erasure. It is always about taking 
first of all, erasing the people and then erasing the property or owning it and therefore changing what it is, and then also erasing the memory of the event itself. And so the, um, you cannot reverse that, but the first step you can do is to actually re-remember what was erased. And, and, and I think that's what the questioner was alluding to, but we don't uh, have uh, his response here. Uh, Umit. I, I, I mostly agree with what, what, what uh, have been said uh, regarding this matter for getting, maybe I can add the following this, it's a matter, it's this, this uh, acknowledgement, which to me would, will be unlikely in the case of Turkey, or I mean, with regards to our main genocide is, it's a matter of exist, uh, existence for Turkey state, and Turkish society, because we usually uh, attribute the power of the denialism from the state vantage point, but denialism in Turkey being reinforced and strengthened by different sections of society in Turkey. So this property issue here uh, plays a key role because you know it touches upon every, you know so many uh, uh, people and families who have no idea about what happened to Armenians actually, but. But all of a sudden, some guy like me comes up with that kind of you know, book, which will be read maybe 1,000 or 2,000 people in, in the academic milieu, talking about, giving all these details, family names, surnames, their family ties and family background. And then the guy all of a sudden happened to learn that, oh, this property even doesn't belong to my great grandfather. These people are not aware of that, right? I mean, as a large picture, they know, of course, they know, you know, Armenians were here, this neighborhood, this, this was used to be an Armenian quarter and so forth. But all these details, and for instance, I received a number of uh, emails from uh, the, 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 you know, third generation offshot of this, all these Muslim, uh, Turkish Muslim families. And they are telling me, my father uh, bought this place from this guy. We paid this amount of money. What are you talking about? What a shame on you, you know? I am gonna sue you, stuff like that. <laughs> but I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not fingering fingering at anyone. It's like I'm trying to explain that this this all these social historical process, this dynamics, and so that that creates this this existential problem. Even every single person, individual, at very micro level, let alone the state. And and this, so I mean, denialism is is so huge. Is, is has so many dimensions. Uh, so actually denialism, uh, uh, this, this kind of denialism uh, aggravates Armenians, you know, this, this, negat uh, this, uh, this negative sentiments and which some of them might even turn into animosity. You know, that of course I'm talking about the, 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 the I mean the, the hardliners, let's say like uh, just, just as it happens in every society. So we cannot just say, okay, what happened in the past, it's just happened. I can't even say the same thing for what happened to Muslim people in the Balkans in 1913 and 1912 and 1913. Another critique, I mean, I don't even consider as a critique, but like an ac accusatory, let's say, uh, claim. Oh, why, are, why, why don't you talk about what happened to Muslims in the Balkans? Nobody denies that. If I knew Bulgarian, Serbian, these kind of languages, I would have happy to work on this topic, you know? So this is, I mean, the, it's, I don't even know how to answer because I think it's, we, we should really, really be cautious and, and, and really respect to the victims by using all these, we don't have any right to use even the, the word forget. Victims have right to use it if they use it. And victims, if they use it, other victims may be accusing of those victims. So that would create, uh, maybe it's, it's gonna be a foxy issue for Turkey. They can use it like that, you know, <laughs> just engulf the whole conflicts among the Armenian society. But I mean, I just, uh, uh, there was this uh, Nietzsche's quote, you know, uh, he said, no matter how far or how fast he may run the chain runs with them. It's something amazing. The moment in one sudden motion there, in one sudden motion gun, before nothing, afterwards nothing, 
nevertheless, co nevertheless come back, comes back again as a ghost and disturbs the tranquility of a later moment. A leaf is continuously relieved from the roll of time, falls out, flutters away, and suddenly flutters back again into the man's lap. For the man says, I remember. Umut, thank you so much. You didn't say I forget, I remember. <laughs> I think this is uh, the right moment to uh, close this panel. We just uh, arrived at the time, but thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, first of all, for writing the book. It's an outstanding book. Thank you, so uh, thank you for participating and thank you to all the panelists, uh, those who are with us and those who had to leave. And of course, thank you for our audience. Uh, and I believe this will be recorded. So those who missed it will be able to uh, watch this on YouTube, I think. So thank you. And thank you to the Watson Institute for hosting this event. And I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.